Okay. <clears throat> so everybody went everybody remembers the psychic exercise we went over last Monday. And today we're gonna to start with the the classic topic called the visualization pipeline. Standard processing stages in visualization. So this is the what the visualization pipeline looks like. This is the kind of the transformation that the data goes through between the time it's living on a disk stored in a file to the time it's depicted in a beautiful graphic. So there are four basic stages, data acquisition. This is usually not something you're involved in, like there, but we know from Monday that there are lots of people producing endless data, right? That's the data acquisition phase, people producing data. And then Carlo just asked about this phase, data enhancement. Sometimes you make modifications to data in order to prepare it for the next stages of the pipeline, the database pipeline like reformatting and so on, or removing values or adding new values. Then there's the visualization mapping phase. That's when data is mapped to like shapes, shapes and colors, essentially. And that's, this is what this module is about. This module is about this visualization mapping. However, we do talk about data enhancement too. But the focus of this module is this phase. And then the final phase is the computer graphics phase, which you're already experts at because you all took computer graphics last year. Oh, actually the master's students didn't take computer graphics last year, right? Is there a computer graphics master's class? Is it, does that exist? Yeah, yeah, it's years ago. Did, did any master students here? Is there a computer graphics master's class no. in existence anymore? It's, it's gone, isn't it? Apparently. Okay. Anyways, third year students are experts at this. This is this is a computer graphics class material. So this was essentially what Monday's lecture was about data acquisition or data production, like people making data, sources of data. There are many different sources of data, right? so I'm not going to repeat all that information. Right? There's medical data, there's text data, data that's stored in databases and spreadsheets, computational fluid dynamics data, modeling data, videos and images, those are just some sample data sources. Public Health England is another data source. In that case, all that data is collected by GPs and, and other NHS personnel that are typing into the key bag. Like This person has this disease. Data enhancement's a little bit more mysterious, so it's between data acquisition and the visualization phase. Data is prepared, or sometimes this is called pre-processing. And there are lots of different ways to pre-process data, or change it or modify it in some way to, to prepare for visualization. Sometimes there's a smoothing phase, so noise is eliminated from the data. Sometimes there's an error discovery in an elimination phase. That happens a lot, by the way. You discover errors in the data and then you want to eliminate them. There are lots of often missing values, so you have to decide how to handle missing values in many cases. If it's data stored on a grid, you may want to modify the grid representation. You may also want to derive new data, like gradients, averages, mins, and maximums, and those sorts of statistics. And we also talk about data interpolation. It's filling in values in between other values. 
and we have some special kind of slides dedicated just to that topic later on. This is the, the primary phase that we're interested in. Once we've done our data acquisition and data enhancement, we want to somehow transform that data into shapes and colors, essentially. Sometimes we use this terminology, geometric primitives, so geometry, primitive geometry, points, lines, triangles, polygons, <coughs> polygons, cubes, tetrahedra, the varying size, shape, color, and transparency. So we take the raw data and put it onto shapes. And sometimes we have straightforward mappings, and sometimes we have very complicated algorithms that do the transformation for us and extract features. Some complicated one, a complicated one is computing an isosurface. Computing glyphs or icons are usually fairly straightforward. Graph layouts can be very complicated. Computing voxel attributes like color and transparency can also be a little bit complicated. And then the final stage is rendering. So this is, we have our set of shapes. They all have colors and transparencies associated with them. And then they are rendered onto the screen. And that is done using computer graphics. And so in computer graphics, the classic <coughs> topics are projection, projection from 3D space to 2D space. Visibility calculation, we calculating which objects are visible and which ones are not visible due to like overlapping or occlusion <coughs> or being off screen. Shading is a kind of classical computer graphics topic. Lots of lots of investment on there. Compositing is another kind of rendering technique that we're going to talk about. And of course, animation is a classical computer graphics technique. We're generally not going to talk about these things, really. We do talk about compositing, but these other things are really core computer graphics topics. And if you have a chance to take a computer graphics class or module, I, I do recommend it, because it's, it's fun. And for reference, I think you've all seen this already, because it's in the syllabus, but there are some recommended books associated with this module. If, if you were only to buy one book, I would, I would recommend this one, the IDB book. If you are feeling really ambitious and you want to buy two books, then these go buy these two books first. This one might be available in the library. If you can't find it in the library, I, I would request it from the library and see if they can get a copy of it for you. Any questions about the first lecture? I might have to do some psychic readings to extract the questions directly from your brain waves. <clears throat> Actually, I, I just got a signal. I did get a signal. Some of you are thinking, those books are really expensive. I don't want to spend the money on those books. Am I correct? I know I'm correct. I know that some of you are thinking about that. My, my response to that is how expensive something is, is relative. I do agree on one hand that the books are expensive, but the expenses are relative. So there are two sort of countermeasures to balance the expense of the book that I can think of off the top of my head. One is buying used books. Right. eBay and Amazon sell used books. I buy used books all the time, you know, to save money. But the, the other thing is, 
to compare the cost of books to the cost of drinking. Like suddenly those books are not that expensive anymore when you compare the cost to alcoholic beverages. I was having this discussion with a student once and he said, oh yeah, I don't buy the books, they're too expensive. And I, I looked up the book we were talking about, it was something like 40 pounds. I, I don't know why this conversation is stuck in my head for the rest of my life. It was, it was a long time ago. And I said, yeah, 40 pounds is kind of expensive, but how much do you spend on one night of drinking? Like, that's what you would spend on one night out of, of, of drinking. He said, are you kidding me? I will spend 80 pounds on a good night out drinking. <laughs> so you, and, and anyways, that, I'll just stop talking about that because it's a long discussion. Or it could be, could be a long discussion. 